Welcome everybody to this Radiopedia Google Hangout, which um, I've made a I made a gross typo in the title of this hangout and called it a Google Gangout. <laughs> so we may we may have a totally different audience to what the normal Radio Radiopedia audience would be. But there you go. I can actually see how many people are viewing it, and there's fifteen thousand. No, <laughs> we could only be so lucky. Um, I'm Andrew Dixon, and I'm in Melbourne, Australia, and we're joined today by... Hey guys, so I thought we'd just go through two intraventricular cases. These two cases are also from a new case pack for the iOS Radiopedia app, which is available through the App Store. So, intraventricular masses is an interesting topic. Amongst all those of neuroradiology, it's unusual in that most of them have very distinctive appearances, and in most cases you can be quite confident about the diagnosis, or at least narrow it down to one or two entities. The importance of being able to do this is also because there's a number of lesions that are benign and that you can safely not operate on, not biopsy, and getting to the ventricles is no mean feat although easier with uh, endoscopic neurosurgery these days. So the first case, this is of a 70-year-old woman who presented with vague headaches, had a CT, which showed an abnormality and went on to get an MRI. What you're seeing on your screen is our uh, quiz mode. So all our cases are visible in this manner, and you can access quiz mode also from uh, the header. The flow and the questions and the way the case is structured is the same as on the iPhone and iPad app. So here we have, uh, first of all, the flare, which shows the abnormality probably most easily as a well-circumscribed mass appearing to arise from the septum pellucidum, slightly T2 hyperintense with areas of signal attenuation. It's not associated with any hydrocephalus. There's no transependinal edema or other masses elsewhere within the brain. T2, it's actually quite difficult to see, and you wonder on older scanners before flare was widely available how many of these were not seen. And on T1, it's relatively easily seen. Uh, but And shouldn't be confused on flare or T2 as a region of uh, signal induced by flow through the foramen of Munro. Not infrequently on flare, you do get what some people call a flare ball of uh, signal due to <laughs> CSF pulsating through the foramen. Importantly, when you give contrast, at most only a few little specks enhance that doesn't vividly enhance at all and there's no evidence of any calcification maybe a few little tiny specks but nothing chunky or clustered there's no calcifications along the subependymal border which you would be looking at for a mass in this region for the presence of tuberous sclerosis the mass doesn't restrict so both uh, our quiz mode and the iPhone app has uh, questions so we have the first question, which is an easy one, where is the abnormality located? And it's in the right lateral ventricle. And if you missed it, there it is. We even drew a dotted line around it. So they went on to have surgery because no one believed the radiologist. And it was found to be a subependymoma, which is a pretty uh, characteristic appearance for this tumour and in a pretty characteristic location and demographic. The differential would largely be that of a central neurocytoma, which could have very similar appearances arising from the septum pellucidum. Usually it's a much younger patient group. And in an asymptomatic patient, she had vague headaches, so perhaps it was felt that these headaches could have been due to intermittent obstruction to the outflow of that right lateral ventricle. But in an asymptomatic patient, subependymomas can be safely observed and unless they demonstrate growth, they don't necessarily need to be resected. There is some overlap between subependymomas and ependymomas, and occasionally, histologically, you find both components within the tumour, in which case they really behave more like an ependymoma, and you'd expect on follow-up imaging that uh, the ependymoma or the mass would grow, and then you would be wanting to resect it anyway. Are you guys all um, familiar with this entity? Because it's one that often yeah. is underappreciated. 
I saw one recently down in the fourth ventricle, and I think it was almost like coming out the foramen of Magendi. And again, like this one, it was it was very very T2 hyper intense, like CSF. Very hard to see on just a T2 sequence. You needed the others to really identify it. The fourth ventricle is actually the classic location, and it's yeah. probably the one where you're most comfortable saying that these yeah. features are almost pathognomonic of, and but you this- really don't want to go fiddle if you don't have to. And this one, I, this one we saw, we actually, um, we called it a, an ependymoma on imaging because it was actually enhancing quite a lot. Is that unusual, Frank? The enhancement of these depends on the size. When they're the typical one centimetre or so lesions, they usually don't enhance at all. Um, they're very bland. They're difficult to see on sequences other than flare, really, and T2. As they get bigger, they become more heterogeneous in appearance. And this one, it's about two centimetres in size. You can see there's some areas that are no longer solid, whether that represents cystic degeneration probably is the case, given that it's a low-grade tumour rather than necrosis. And there's little areas of probable calcification or maybe blood product in them. And as they get bigger and bigger, they can look more and more like an ependymoma. Yeah, Um, the one one we had was a little bit bigger and it did have, you know, quite big calcifications on the CT. I was just going to ask Andrew actually about the pathology. It's very easy to tell between subependymoma and ependymoma on pathology. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Um, I don't do a lot of neuropathology, but uh, I still remember it from my exam days that certainly ependymomas are much more cellular lesion and whereas the subependymomas are much more fibrillary lesion with little clusters of ependymal cells, so it should be, yeah. One of the things that you have to be aware of when dealing with histology of of brain tumours or intracranial tumours is that unlike elsewhere in the body, rarely are the tumours able to be resected on block or even as a whole chunk of tissue. The vast majority of especially parenchymal tumours but also intraventricular tumours, because of the limitation in access or surgical field, they tend to be broken up and most of the tumour goes up the sucker the degree of sampling bias present in neuro cases is perhaps higher than in the periphery. And the pathologist doesn't have the benefit of seeing the whole specimen and palpating it or seeing it or whatever you guys do to them to decide where to take your samples from. You would usually get just... The magic we do, Frank, the magic. The magic yeah. You wouldn't get that sort of uh, information of a, a good macroscopic feel for the whole tumour and you'd be just relying on no, the fragments. No, that's true. Um, and so it is conceivable that what you saw that looks like an ependymoma is one of these subependymoma that has ependymoma components and that the bit that was sent to the lab was the subependymoma component. So more and more as we get better at imaging, we realise that we do need to take the appearance on imaging seriously. And if it looks funny when you match that up to the histology, you should just be aware that you might not have the full diagnosis of the whole tumour. And so in this case, well, it's come back subependymoma, but it looked like an ependymoma. You'd be keen to have more frequent surveillance of uh, that patient. Yeah, and and definitely in our report, we... We didn't really give a differential. We just said, you know, this is characteristic of, of, a, of a pandemoma. It was, in, you know, insinuating out a, out a foramen. Was um, it an elderly patient? Uh, yeah, they were over 60 years old. Okay. Well, it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable getting the subependymoma diagnosis, given yep. that appendomomas are so much less frequent in the elderly. All righty. The second case, and this is a three-month-old kid who um, wasn't doing terribly at all when they were born, but um, over the first three months, their head circumference started increasing. And one of the great benefits of imaging neonates is that because of their fontanelles and how thin the skull vault is in general, we're still able to see inside the brain using ultrasound, which is very convenient given you can't really CT or MR a a kid without giving them general anaesthetic, whereas you can stick a probe on their head. And uh, the imaging quality that you get with modern ultrasound scanners through the fontanelles is remarkable. And so here we have uh, coronal sections through the brain. And just to orient you, we have the lateral ventricles, the septum pellucidum. Here is the top of the kid's head through the frontal fontanelle. We have the temporal lobes. And here we have the frontal lobes surrounding the lateral ventricles. You can see that the ventricles are markedly dilated. So this child's head circumference is increasing because they have hydrocephalus. And as we come further back, we can see choroid plexus coming around the corner 
uh, along the cordothalamic groove and here in the temporal horn. And on this side, we can see an echogenic mass continuous with it. And as we come further back towards the trigone of the lateral ventricle, we have a large echogenic mass, which is lobulated as an isolated abnormality. It's hard to tell what its boundaries with the adjacent brain are, and whether on ultrasound, whether this is an exophytic or endophytic mass into the lumen of the ventricle, or whether it's purely intraventricular is difficult. Here we have some sagittal images. Again, the anatomy is quite striking and of corpus callosum. Here we have the mass with chorid plexus coming around and the very dilated ventricular system. The nose of the child is here. This is the base of skull, pituitary, clivus, down to posterior fossa. So where is the abnormality located? Well, it's in the trigone of the lateral ventricles and are the ventricles? No, they're markedly abnormal. And, uh, if you were doing this as an exam case, you'd It'd be crazy not to mention that they had obstructive hydrocephalus and they required urgent um, neurosurgical consultation. Would you definitely say obstructive hydrocephalus because, uh, you know, the trigone is not necessarily going to obstruct anything. Um, well, and you may, term, be, you may have a tumour which is overproducing CSF instead. You might. That's an interesting point. And the idea that you have two types of hydrocephalus which are obstructive and communicating is something that most residents and registrars and other doctors uh, talk about. It's really shorthand for two different pathways of uh, hydrocephalus. On the one hand, you have whether the hydrocephalus results from an obstruction to CSF absorption somewhere between the arachnoid villi and their production in the choroid. So you can have obstructive hydrocephalus anywhere along the pathway it's true that many causes of obstructive hydrocephalus are mechanical, such as aqueduct stenosis or a tumour compressing a foramen of Munro, etc. But many of the patients who have, uh, say, a previous subarachnoid hemorrhage or bacterial meningitis will have obstruction to CSF absorption at the level of the arachnoid villi or obstruction to CSF flow through the basal cisterns. And so what they have is communicating obstructive hydrocephalus. And the other term is communicating and not communicating, and all that refers to is whether or not the pathway for CSF flow is clear out of the fourth ventricle. So there's not many communicating non-obstructive hydrocephaluses. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is one of them. Overproduction of CSF is very rare. And uh, we usually use just the term obstructive versus communicating as a sort of dirty shorthand way of thinking about it. So, he had a ventricular peritoneal shunt inserted to treat the hydrocephalus. And here you can see it going through from the right-hand side, right bright occipital region with the catheter going uh, through the ventricle uh, and uh, just abutting the genu of the corpus callosum. And what we see on this CT is that uh, the mass is very large and uh, hyperdense very lobulated. It appears to be centered exactly within the trigone of the lateral ventricle. You can see how dilated the temporal horns are. Small locules of gas have been introduced during the surgical process, lying here in the frontal horn and posteriorly in the ambient cistern, as well as a couple of locules in the, in the subarachnoid space. So really the differential now is the important thing. Likely our diagnosis is that of a choroid plexus papilloma. This is the classic location for them. They're typically vividly enhancing, sharply demarcated and lobulated tumours. And in paediatric group, you probably know that most tumours occur in the posterior fossa, uh, whereas adult tumours, most of them occur supratentorially. This is the one where the demographics uh, are reversed. So a supratentorial choroid plexus papilloma is usually encountered in children, whereas when found in the posterior fossa, it's usually in adults. And uh, differentiating a choroid plexus carcinoma from a choroid plexus papilloma, there's features that you need to call it a carcinoma, but there's nothing on imaging to say that this is not a carcinoma. So the features that you need to call it a carcinoma are evidence of invasion into the parenchyma uh, or evidence of necrosis of the mass and very rapid growth is uh, another distinguishing feature, although choroplexus papillomas can also grow quite quickly. The question of the mechanism by which they cause 
hydrocephalus. Initially, it was thought that it was all overproduction. Uh, and although that's definitely a case, a part of it is believed, and perhaps the majority of it, is that these tumours shed cellular debris into the ventricular system that flows along CSF and ends up gumming up the arachnoid villi over the convexities. So there's both a obstructive and a production component. So they went on uh, to have a biopsy, and then they were re-imaged a couple of months later. And this is uh, the poor child's well. tumour only two months or three months later. You can see the amount of growth has been dramatic. And um, here we can see the shunt catheter still in, but it's taken over the whole hemisphere. There's clearly edema in the surrounding brain. There's invasion through where the surgical biopsy was taken. There's even some enhancing that might be just choroid plexus on the other side, or it may be a region of uh, intraventricular seeding. And so the histology at the time of biopsy and clearly now on imaging is that of a choroid plexus carcinoma. So even though this looked very much like a choroid plexus papilloma, you can't really exclude carcinomatous components and uh, they all really do require biopsy and excision if possible. If you can completely excise it, then you have a chance at cure, but with uh, very large tumours or incomplete excision, then the prognosis is terrible, and I believe this child passed away shortly thereafter, which is not a terribly positive note to end a hangout on, I suppose. <laughs> or even a gangout. Yeah. <laughs> were they not biopsied after their CT or at the time of... But they were, and the diagnosis okay. was carcinoma. Okay. There was nothing much to do. I think they debulked it as much as they safely could, and I'm not sure what um, chemo or radiotherapy they received, but none of it is particularly effective. No. So when you get to the end of a case, both on the app or on the site, you'll get a brief discussion of any pertinent features of this case in specifically, but more importantly, any of the related articles are linked to. So if you want to read more about a particular case or see other examples of them, you can come through. And you can see these other two examples that we've got a very similar, very aggressive appearing tumours which really take over the, the brain mm. very rapidly. You can't imagine any surgery that's not going to have dramatic uh, neurological sequelae resecting all of this at this stage. It's just been submitted and it should be available for download in a week or so. so and we cover all the common ones. And in the uh, case of you know, ependymoma, for example, we have more than one example to show you a typical and an atypical example. And we have some uncommon ones and also some that mimic tumours that you might otherwise think that you're looking at a tumour, but you might be looking at a normal structure or some benign lesion. Yeah. yeah, I just want to finish off by thanking everybody who's been watching the live stream tonight and anyone who's watching this in the future on the Radiology channel. I'd also like to thank all the guys who've joined us here. If you have any feedback about how these uh, Hangout sessions would benefit you the most, then if you leave some comments on the Radiology channel um, video page, that'd be great. Uh, anyone got any final words? Have a good night. I'm going to bed. <laughs> You're going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> see you, Matt. And uh, we'll see you all next time on, uh, on the Radiopedia Google Hangout. Thank <laughs> you.